like the array is zero to one. To one. And uh, the gamma distribution does the same, but in a different way. And uh, here again, alpha and beta are very shape and wave term here. And the uh, normal distribution uses a new uh, variance or some uh, variation. Uh, what? And uh, it's okay. like this. Oh. So what's the good story? Uh, yeah. Since we're yeah. recording, Maybe if you want, if you go on, so let's like, start. Uh, oh, welcome to the crash course for basic so statistics. Can everybody hear me? Uh, yes. Of course. Yes. yes. Our important patient calls us, and we will end with some exercises. So, uh, and then you have a number of occurrences, and then it's the gamma is just going to be the expected value of occurrences over that interval. So it's just um, it's just a number of occurrences divided by that interval. This is just yeah. what you could do. So if you uh, for example what something happens one times per minute then you can uh, define it in minute, rate per minute, so it will, lambda will be one, which can also be defined in hours, so uh, lambda will be one defined by sixty. Okay, um, so now to probably the, the rate boss of all the topics of information statistics, is at least as that is how I felt last year. So I, th I think um, in the, the lectures, Max described it as, as like a general problem that when you when you apply Bayesian inference, you normally I draw here, you have like the, the upper terms, so the likelihood in your prior, and then on the bottom you have the evidence for, or, or also called marginal likelihood. And sometimes it just happens that this integral over all possible parameter values is just not computable. So it, it's simply not derivable. And um, in such a case, what you can do is you can, for example, pick um, a prior and the likelihood that are conjugate to each other. And that simply means that this integral then, so at the bottom, uh, so the, <coughs> the denominator then actually has a closed form solution. So it is computable. And the posterior turns out to be then of the same form as the prior. Here we have also a couple of examples. Those are by no means all uh, all uh, conjugate, uh, conjugate distributions there are. There are plenty more and also don't take uh, for granted that only those are going to be asked on the exam. But I think Max will not do anything like the, if I remember correctly, the Dirichlet multinomial. That's very unlikely because those conjugacy proofs are usually uh, very difficult. Um, We'll not show an example right now, but we'll do that later. So to also give you time to work work out. So we'll first give them give an, an overview how we approach these kind of proofs, and then we'll give you an exercise to actually apply the framework, try it yourself, and then afterwards we'll show uh, show the proof. Go ahead, next slide. Yes, I'm trying to. But yeah. Okay. Um, another way. So if the integral at the bottom of the fraction is Actually, not in um, not in closed form. There is a possibility of simply drawing. Of, well, in this case, it's uh, stepwise plugging in values for those parameters of interest. So, for example, think of um, <coughs> think of the. So, so this is an example here. We have a, a, a weirdly constructed prior that that's that, that's just like a wave distribution that's normalized. And then for a likelihood, we have a binomial. So what we could do, for example, is we could um, like plug in different uh, possible values for theta into this marginal likelihood. Then evaluate, so, so simply plug that, those in into the formula, um, get the values, add them together, and then after the end, you have to multiply by the step size. Um, by the step size you chose for uh, the different uh, parameter values. Um, maybe go to the next slide. We I have um, a showcase example, not for a distribution, but for just for a simple function. So um, just suppose you have a, a line, um, the function f of x equals x, and we want to uh, compute the integral by means of grid approximation. What you could simply do then is just uh, choose a step size, for example, of 0 0.5. So we evaluate the, the value of that function first at, at 0, then at 0 0.5, and then at 1. Add those terms together, which gives you 1.5. And then afterwards, we multiply by 0 0.5 the step size to obtain uh, 0, uh, 0 0.75. 
So um, the smaller the step size, of course, the more the solution or the approximation of, of that integral approaches actually the exact solution. The problem here is though that for um, Bayesian inference you often have cases where um, you have multi-dimensional integrals. So it's not simply an integral over one parameter value, but like a stacked integral. So, so maybe four integrals in a row, and then you have to integrate over four different values. And the problem here is that when you then want to like plug in different values for those, you, you almost like you need huge amounts of values in order to approximate that integral. So like conversion is, is almost impossible here um, because of I mean, you've probably heard of it, it's a so-called curse of dimensionality that just the number of points uh, grow, I think, exponentially with dimension. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. All right, and um, well, a third solution of that problem is MCMC. So here the idea is that instead of plugging in values into this, this bottom term of the fraction, which, which then normalizes the distribution, right? The, the, the top part is just, um, is just the general shape of the distribution and the bottom part defines the, the normalization. Instead of plugging in or approximating that normalization, MCMC uses a neat trick, namely just, uh, just directly sampling from the posterior. And it, it does that by, um, by means of um, an acceptance ratio. So you can see here that you have a, a proposed theta and uh, we simply compute the probability of that proposed theta. We can do that by, by just plugging in that, um, that uh, proposed theta into, into the base formula. So uh, we, we then plug it into the top part, into the bottom part as well. And we do the same for another, um, uh, for, the, for the current theta we're at. And the, the neat thing then about it is that if you divide these, these two fractions by each other, so, on, so for, the, for the first fraction you have um, just the, the, the likelihood of the proposed theta given the data times the prior of the proposed theta divided by the marginal likelihood. And at the bottom part you have the same thing again with the marginal likelihood. What happens then is the marginal likelihoods cancel out. So you can by basically... Um, yeah, you can basically compare the, the, the ratios in those in that posterior distribution directly without even having to compute the um, the integral, the marginal likelihood at the bottom. Did that point become clear? Maybe you can give feedback in the chat for whether I need to. All right. All right. Okay. <clears throat> then maybe also something about the about the proposed data. So in that posterior distribution. Um, where does that proposed theta come from? Well, we can actually use, um, well, that's kind of preference what we want to use, but um, Max gave an example with the Gaussian. So you simply propose a theta based on the, based on a Gaussian distribution with a current, uh, with current theta as an expected value and, and a certain variance around it. Depending on that variance, of course, in the Gaussian, um, you can make a big proposal step or a small small proposal step. Um, how to choose these uh, how to choose these proposal distributions is a, is, a, is, a, is a topic of research itself because um, because you tend to not know when it makes sense to make a big step in in, in, in MCMC and when it makes sense to make a small step. That that of course depends on the on the underlying model. So sometimes it might be that you just have um, just a, imagine a, dis a posterior distribution, for example, with with many maxima, so uh, and, and 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 values in between them. Then, for example, it it would make sense to take big steps because you want to visit all these maxima of that of that uh, of that distribution. Whereas when you, for example, just have um, something that is like just a one-dimensional case, for example. Um, sorry, a two-dimensional case, um, the, the Gaussian distribution with just one peak, then the steps could be small because you know that um, it, it will it will mostly or it will very likely visit all the points, uh, the MCMC algorithm, compared to 
when uh, in the other in the other posterior with, with multiple peaks if you there chose for example um, a proposal distribution where the uh, the proposed theta is very close um, very close to the current it might just get stuck in one of those maxima not visit the other ones and therefore not approximate the, the shape of the posterior correctly or um, appropriately yeah I would do this one, right? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, how do we check if uh, MCMC is converged? Uh, it's important that it's converged because otherwise uh, these samples are not really reliable. Uh, so uh, we can look at uh, three. Uh, yeah, we can do three checks. So tra uh, look at trace plots, look at density plots, and look if the samples are autocorrelated. Let's first start with trace plots. That's uh, this one and this one, and we can clearly see. This one uh, converts better than this one. Uh, so you can look if the uh, chains are uh, distinguishable. That means that they uh, converge uh, because they don't uh, uh, are independent or like, not independent, but they don't depend on their starting points anymore. And uh, for example, for this one, we need a burn in. That means uh, cutting away the first few iterations so that they do not depend too much on their starting position again. Uh, the density plots uh, are these two, uh, which we probably have seen a lot in uh, the assignments. Uh, again, we are going to look at the, uh, the chains. And uh, for this one, we see that every chain has a different uh, distribution, which again is influenced by their starting position and the random uh, steps they take. But when we uh, have a lot of iterations, uh, you can see that the chains all become similar. And uh, the last thing to check is if the samples are autocorrelated. Uh, if they are autocorrelated, means that the next sample depends a lot on the previous, uh, or not that there is like a, a linear trend in how the same uh, samples depend on each other, right, for you? Oh, sorry, I'm just scanning the chat, so. Yeah, autocorrelation means that there's a linear uh, relation in the samples, right? How they depend on each other. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be linear. Yeah, but but I think, a, yeah. there is a relation other than. Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that you uh, can see in this plot, but it's, it's more like how autocorrelated you can see uh, really what the autocorrelation is in this plot, but it just means that uh, that they will, yeah, that the samples are very close to each other. Uh, so, um, and a um, very interesting part of Bayesian statistics is uh, comparing two models. Uh, we, uh, we can see, uh, over, yeah, like it says here, it's interesting to see uh, how probable so certain uh, variables are given certain models or hypotheses. Uh, but it's even more interesting because just one probability doesn't, uh, distribution doesn't say a lot, it's interesting to see how uh, it relates to other uh, models. So we can uh, calculate it this way. So uh, we do the prior odds uh, times the base vector, which is the data given one model defined by the data given another model. Uh, if, the, if we have no preferences of which hypothesis is more likely, the prior odds will be Half divided by half, which is one. So we just have the base vector is the same as the posterior world. So that is how likely are either of the models given uh, the data. So what we basically want to obtain is uh, the posterior world, which is again, uh, the, yeah, this is for the example of uh, the binomial distribution. So given the set and n, how likely is model one and how likely is model two, and to calculate it. Uh, to calculate the posterior odds, we do the, again the base vector times the posterior odds. So here is the example. So given the data uh, set is 6 and n is 9, and we have two uh, models, one that uses a beta with a is 3 and b is 8, one that uses a uh, is 9 and b is 2, and then we we'll calculate the two uh, likelihoods. And then those are the two likelihoods. And then we can uh, use those to compute the base vector. The prior odds are, like I said before, one in some cases, like this one. 
and then we can calculate the posterior odds by the base factor times uh, the posterior odds, which is still the base factor. Uh, and then we do some smart calculus to calculate this one because uh, you have to re like reshape the formula to get one of them. Uh, should I explain how to do that for you, or is yeah. that trivial? Yeah. yeah, okay, so for example, we can do it by replacing M2 by, or M1, yeah, okay, what it says here, so M2 can be replaced by 1 minus M1, because we only have two bottles and a distribution uh, will go to 1. And uh, then if we plug that in, it will say uh, P M1 divided by 1 minus P M1 is the base factor, then we do what's here times the base factor, which then gives base factor a minus base factor times the uh, probability. Then we uh, reshape it to say uh, base factor is uh, my. No, let's do it the other way around. So uh, th then it says uh, probability plus base factor times probability is the base factor. And then we can divide it by both sides by 1 plus the base factor, and then we get P M1 is the base factor divided by 1 plus the base factor. And then you have to posterior odds for one of the models, and then we just do like it said here 1 minus that probability, and then we get the for the other model. Is that clear, my explanation? Let's see in the chat. Oh, there are some questions. On Convergence. I didn't follow the last step. So you mean how to? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have uh, the probability of M1 plus base factor times probability is the base factor. Uh, we can rewrite the left part as uh, probability times the two brackets one plus uh, base factor, and then we can divide both sides with. That one plus uh, base factor. Is it clear or should I write it down? Oh, yeah. N uh, the uh, answer to Nikki's question is yes. And to Chris Pine is yes as well. Uh, it would help for me if you write it down. Okay. Can I write in here? <coughs> yes, I can. Okay. So we have. Uh, we'll get my mouse. So we, I just call it P because I don't want to write down the M1. So we have P if O. Oh, this does. Okay. I told you. <laughs> this is beautiful. Okay, so we have, we have this. And this we can write down as. Oh, uh, where are you? Where are you? Yeah, here you are. This we can write down as O. Uh, yes, let's go. I will skip some steps because it's very annoying to uh, write this down. Uh, minus P times this. This step is clear. And then. I think so, and then we can write this down as P plus P. This is a time sign. Because we add P times PF to both sides. And this is, so the left part is the same as 
times. One, one, one. Close. P F. And then if we define both sides by this part, we will get uh, this. Okay, let's see in the chat if it's clear. Seagull patients. What are we trying? The posterior. So the po we found. Uh, I'm so also lost. Whoa, I thought it was clear. So what we find right now is that P, uh, the so the probability of M1 given data divided by the probability of M2 given data is uh, 0 0.28 for the base vector. But this just says something about the uh, relation uh, or like the yeah like the rela uh, relative difference between them. Yeah, between or, them. or you could say the, the likelihood of the data coming from model one compared to uh, the likelihood of the data coming from model two. Yes. Indeed. Uh, yes. So but th then we only have like the relative difference because we divide them. So we have to find out what is the posterior probability of one of the models, and that we do by uh, this uh, magic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but Oh, so many questions. This is also what we can look up in these tables, uh, right? The yeah. base factor you can look up, yes. And how to interpret it? That's yeah. what the posterior uh, probabilities are. Uh, yeah, it, it, it means uh, 0 to 28 means that model 2 is more likely than model 1. But what we now find is the posterior probability of one of them is this. So we don't just see if one is more likely than the other, we can really have a distribution in the two because yeah. the other model is this likely and the other model is this likely. And that's why we would want to do this. Where is the chat? Chat. Chat, yes. Well, so, so in the exercises you were, you were mainly asked to conclude based on the posterior model probabilities, right? So you have these, you have these um, posterior uh, samples of your models when you construct your model comparison in BEX, and then you were supposed to compute the reverse. So from these posterior model probabilities, compute the base factor. But in the exercise presented on the exam, you're more likely to be uh, or to be able to compute the base factor and then based on the base factor and the prior or the prior odds uh, compute the posterior model probabilities. So it's the other way around when you do it on, on paper because um, in JAX we only dealt with um, with models where this marginal likelihood so the, the term the term uh, the terms that the base factor is made um, made uh, consists of um, we most uh, we mainly dealt with models where that was not computable, right? That's why we applied MCMC to it. Uh, so the, the distributions weren't conjugate to each other. So we had to apply MCMC, uh, obtain the posterior model probabilities, and then from there uh, get the base factor. But on the exam, you will be able to compute the marginal likelihoods, and then you also you are also able to compute the base factor, and then based on that. According to what Sigurd just tried to explain, you, you'll be able to comp uh, also compute the posterior odds. Indeed. Okay, so uh, is this clear or should I uh, should I explain some more? I don't know what to explain more, but I can repeat everything I said. Can I maybe ask a question like this? With yeah. The chat. Okay. Um, so the base vector is uh, like uh, how it's written down. It's like the probability of set comma n divided of given one of the models and then divided the two, right? Yes. Um, but it's also like the other way around then, because in the the part that Sigur wrote on the slides, it says probability divided by one minus probability, and that probability was the probability of the model itself, right? 
<laughs> I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to. Like the, the, the p over 1 minus p is base vector? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is that p exactly? This p, or this p. That p, the, the one you're pointing This is the same as this, but I didn't want to write down the uh, n1 given set n every time. Yeah, but on the, on the left part of the slide it says base factor is the probability of z, n. Yeah, those are the likelihoods. So we oh, should put here. Uh -huh. So we compute the likelihoods. What is uh, the probability of the data given the, the model? We computed those, uh, calculated those to uh, compute the base factor because we want to do uh, this set, which is okay, this one. So we calculate this, this is one, and uh, if we calculate this, we can then compute the posterior probabilities. P stands for your posterior probability. Uh, yes. So already uh, somebody writing that in the chat. I get it, I guess. So um, in yeah, yeah. this case, P over 1 minus P equals the F because the fireworks, yeah. firework was 1. 1, exactly. Yeah. Okay, get it, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And model comparison also makes a crucial assumption. Well, it makes the assumption that, or the posterior model probability makes a crucial assumption, namely that the two models at stake have to be equal to one. But technically, there are infinite models which can describe data. So, yeah. But that is a side thing. Yeah, but this is for the, the, the distribution over these two models, right? Because you yeah, have yeah. the model comparison yeah. of two models. Yeah. No. Uh, yes. So should I continue? Because in the case, like how to calculate the. What do you mean by the B function? Yeah. Uh, ah, that's what you mean. Yes. Okay. Uh, what is that again? I, don't I mean, know. that's the. I mean, that's just the marginal likelihood, right? Yeah, but how do you use the, what is the uh, beta function, I almost forget. But it's just the beta function. Oh, it's just beta. It's, it's beta to the power of n. In that case, you're 6 plus 9. Um, yes, yeah. sir. Is it? Uh, yes. No, this the yes, 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 of course, of course. Yeah, it's just, it's just a beta distribution. Yeah, the beta function, so it's the one that, uh, that looks in him to uh, send the chat. So, ga uh, gamma of A. Do you think Max will ask a question how to calculate the B, this one? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. But it's not the most important uh, part no, it, to it's understand. Just imp <laughs> the important part about model comparison is how to okay, first get the, get the marginal likelihoods, compute the base factor, and based on the result you get for the base factor, you have to be able to compute posterior model probabilities. from model one so because we have model one defined by model two it the base factor says the model one is zero or the data is zero to 28 more likely from model one to model two which means that model two is more likely and if we have model two defined by model one this is just one over zero dot 28. Okay, I think we can go on to the next slide if there are no 
Oh wait, should you interpret the posterior odds and the base fact in the same way then? Um, they are related, of course. Yes, but, but the, the base factor is the... Uh, the, the relative, the, yeah, the relative term and the posterior odds, I'd say, are, are the absolute terms. No, that's also the posterior probabilities is the absolute term. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, but the posterior odds, she asked. So oh. base factor is uh, how, how likely is the data given this model, and the posterior odds is the like the diff, like the fraction but, uh, of uh, how likely is the model given the data. Is that yeah? Okay, nice. And uh, we can also always have more questions at the end, but let's yeah. now continue. Uh, you were doing this part, right, Florian? Oh, yes, yeah. my bad, my <laughs> bad, my bad. <laughs> so, uh, important Bayesian concepts. Um, so, um, shrinkage is, of course, one of them. And shrinkage just means that, so uh, if, you, if you imagine a model where you have data that you assume to come from different groups, for example. So um, maybe a good example would be um, a set of outcomes of, of coin tosses, right? And you think that these these coin tosses can be can be modeled with uh, with the same likelihood, but the likelihood would use different different thetas for the probabilities of these separate coins of coming up heads, for example. But you so instead of having two separate priors for for these both groups, um, you choose to use just one prior distribution over theta and draw both thetas for both likelihoods from that prior. Then what will happen is that these thetas, even though the the outcomes, um, so so the data you collected might be very different, so it might actually. Um, get, um, yeah, lead you to think that those thetas are actually very, very different from each other. What will happen is they will be pulled together because of that uh, of that uh, common um, of that common prior they have. So this is what's called uh, shrinkage. So if you have lower level parameters and you have and they are dependent on a higher group level parameter, that's yeah. Thanks, you're perfect. They are they are pulled towards towards that group level parameter. And it's a very nice thing um, that this happens because um, just imagine in a frequentist analysis, if you have a bunch of outliers, sometimes you do pre-processing on a data set to remove those, those outliers to not bias your results. In Bayesian statistics, you don't have to care about that if you set up an according model. You can of course also set, uh, set up a different model then this wouldn't happen. But um, with, a, with a, a shared group level parameter, um, Bayesian statistics can actually account for these outliers and sort of ignore them by pulling the thetas towards kind of the average of, of these two groups. Yeah, that's shrinkage. I think you want to do Occam's razor, right? Oh, okay. I would do the, I would uh, girls going to do the exercises. All right, all right, all right. Um, okay, another, uh, another important co uh, concept then is um, Occam's razor. This is also a very nice property um, um, Bayesian statistics makes use of, uh, especially, or, well, um, let me think. I think it's mainly used in model comparison or in hypothesis set testing, which is, uh, so, which is model comparison, sort of. Um, and that is, if you have a very complex model, right, then this model allows uh, for, for plenty of data sets to, uh, to fit. So, Actually, it has to it has to sort of distribute its probability mass over uh, over multiple possible data sets over a bunch of data sets. So this is what the the lower part uh, in the graph looks like. This would be a very com complex model which can um, fit and adapt to many data sets, or or in, in the in the generative terms speaking, it can produce many data sets. And if you were to com compare such a model to a model that cannot produce a lot of data sets and you, um, you actually observe a data set that falls within the range of both. So kind of in the, within the range of, the, of the, the, the kind of the bell shape distribution, then what happens is 
the the model with uh, with um, less complexity is automatically preferred in and that also then can be seen in the base factor by um, yeah yeah the base the base factor would then favor the model that is um, that is less complex because um, for for that data set you observe it just has a way higher probability um, of of coming from that uh, from that less complex model. However, if you were to uh, if you were to have a data set that is generally very unlikely, then uh, then this wouldn't happen. But that's just the property of um, Occam's razor that um, models with uh, lower complexity uh, by say, like with, and that have the same performance as, as as complex models should always be preferred. And in Bayesian statistics, this is actually something that that happens implicitly. Any questions about that? I have a question for the chat. What is the uh, simple, uh, mo uh, most simple model that uh, can exist? There's a question for you, Florian. Uh, yes, yes. Like, let me first answer the questions that are uh, like that are asked yeah. about those. So, what do you mean with single number? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay, let me start. Actually, let me start. Uh, we would have different priors for them. It would not happen, right? No. Dif if what, you what? Did different priors on theta, that there's no shrinkage on theta. Oh yes, yes. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because then, um, then the prior or the the theta learned, the overall theta learned would only or would separately depend. It would be arrows just pointing downwards, uh, other than pointing to a common prior. So yeah, it would only it will only be changed according to the data of those two likelihoods. That's yeah. The the goal of shrinkage is. Um, is to remove the effect of outliers. Well, I wouldn't say it's the goal, it's the effect of that shrinkage has. And somewhere was a question, why is simple Gaussian distribution preferred over a GMM? So I'll come to raise an explanation for this. Um, yes, it is. Yes, it is, absolutely. Because so, for example, a Gaussian mixture model, what it does is, or at least the one we uh, we saw in one of the exercises where you were supposed to do clustering, right? So, making an assumption that the data actually comes from different clusters um, that makes or makes a Gaussian mixture model um, be able to fit lots of data sets, whereas you could simply assume that the entire data sets come just from a simple, just from one Gaussian, which might as well be, then the, then the simple uh, Gaussian model is preferred. So for shrinkage, it is better to have a lot of observations. Um, it, I think it definitely has an effect, yes. Although if you if you have lots of observations, it it will probably reduce the effect of shrinkage because um, or will and it? the prior has a smaller influence on yeah. what the value for theta will be. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Well, it would. Yeah, but it, the question is if it would be better, right? I think it would just reduce the effect of shrinkage. I think the like the why we want shrinkage is that you don't if you don't have a lot of data then you don't want to make uh, conclusions too soon so it's good that uh, yeah. the found thetas are closer but if you have a lot of observations it doesn't matter if they have different priors or the same prior because you will get yeah, you have so much data that you will find the same thetas I think right yeah that's a nice point yes have the H two that you in the distribution of the the one Gaussian is the H1 that you see. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. So All right. Because of the marginal likelihood, this GMM will be lower. Yes, exactly. Okay, and then the simplest model is just a spike prior. Just, so it puts all its uh, probability mass on a single number. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the last concept that was, I think it was just briefly introduced. We also had to search for that a bit. It's, it appears in like uh, in, in lecture two, I think, in lecture nine, and then in the last lecture as well, is the posterior predictive. So the idea here is that you train a model on data, and then you feed that model uh, a new data point, or you, you, you try to predict uh, new data based on, on the already trained model. And um, in the exercise, I've seen a couple of people just plugging in the, the most uh, or the, the, the maximum likelihood estimate for, for the parameter of interest into the posterior where we draw these values from, which is not entirely correct because uh, what you essentially want to do is you want to uh, obtain in a distribution uh, for, for, um, for the next data point. And um, you do that by, by integrating over all possible values for the parameter of interest for a, for, for a single value for the data point. So think of this integral as basically we, we add together x equals 1 for all possible values of theta. We add the probability of that together. That makes one point in the distribution. Then we go on for the next value for x, let's say 2. We add, we, uh, we add together all the probabilities um, and, and so on and so forth. And this is basically how you can uh, obtain a predictive distribution for, um, for a new data point on an already trained model. And the, the prior here in the, in the posterior predictive uh, co computation is simply the posterior of your trained model. You can also see that here. This is just the theta given the data. And uh, the, the term at front is simply the, the, the likelihood you have used so far. Are there any questions about that? Was that clear? How the computation works here. I, I can, yeah, I don't think there are any questions in the chat, so uh, let's continue. All right. Okay, so uh, now we, uh, we are uh, at uh, examples of uh, how to compute conjugacy. Uh, we'll first show our own uh, how we would approach this and give a solution, and then we have one exercise for you which we will also explain later, but you have to do it yourselves first. So we are going to uh, uh, find the posterior distribution for a like, an exponential uh, likelihood and a gamma prior. Uh, does anyone still remember how these uh, look? Or should I just go to the next? I will just go to the next slide. Uh, what, so we have n data points, n data points of x, which is the likelihood. So with the n data points, we will multiply all those. And then this, uh, so we have n times the exponential uh, distribution, which is n times this. Maybe, which we maybe can... mention shortly that um, you can simply do this because you're assuming independence yeah, yeah, between the, the different observations. So you can simply multiply the, the individual likelihoods by each other. Yeah, so if p, x, comma, y and x and y are independent, you can do p, x times p, y. And uh, this we can rewrite, so this part we can rewrite as this to the power of n, and then the sum of the uh, what's in the exponential. There's a question in the chat. Can we assume uh, that I'd say 99% yes. <laughs> yeah, but it should be given, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, the good old conjugacy with exponential. So we are basically just taking the likelihood for one data point. Uh, no, we, because uh, we split those up and multiply each, and this is a multiplication sign. So for i from 1 up until n, we are going to multiply this term for x dependent on, or like the i to x. Yeah, the i observation, yes. So it's still uh, all the data. And uh, the prior of the gamma is this. So uh, this is the gamma function, b to the power of alpha. And, uh, maybe maybe also also mention the last term of the of the likelihood of simplification because you skipped over that. Yeah. Okay. So if we multiply uh, exponentials, we can 
adds them together. The the like the terms in the in the power they can be added. I don't know if you know this rule, but it's also kind of hard to prove right now. Uh, well, 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 I mean, you you can write just two to the power of two. Yeah, I would. Times but that's not a proof. That's an example. So if we have, for example, uh, pen. So we have two to the power of two times two power of three, which is four times eight, which is 32, which is two times two, which is four times two, which is eight times two, which is 16 times two, which is 32. Oh, which is two to the power of five, which is three plus two. <laughs> so if we have a, a product of multiple exponentials, we can take the sum of all the terms in the uh, power of the exponential. Nice proof, QED. Yes, yeah. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel I'm taken serious. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, prior, so given it alpha and a beta here, it says like conditional alpha and beta here. We skip that, but it's the same. Oh, is the prior here the gamma? The, yeah, it's the gamma distribution. Uh, was something... Did I make a mistake? But let's go back. The first slide, it was different. What? Yeah, so here there's a gamma, it says yes. Oh, yes. Uh, you miss? Yeah. yeah, but I copied everything from the slides. Uh, but maybe that's just some reordering because the beta is gamma eta, alpha, gamma beta, divided by gamma alpha beta. Maybe if you rewrite that, it will become this. I have no clue. No, stick stick to that formula for the gamma. Yeah, this one is better. Yeah, and also also the one you'll find on Wikipedia if you just search for uh, for the distribution, the probability yeah. density function. You'll find that one. This is definitely correct. Yeah, so you're right. You go. So uh, okay, okay. Yes. So the posterior is uh, is like this term, which is the same as. This, the likelihood times the prior divided by the marginal likelihood and the marginal likelihood is the sum of all uh, of all the likelihoods and priors given this lambda or any other variable if you use no other variable. Uh, but uh, since we only want to uh, uh, how should I explain? Uh, since we only want to see uh, if it's the conjugate form of the posterior, uh, we are not interested in the marginal likelihood because it's uh, the, the this is linear to this whole formula because the marginal likelihood just uh, scales everything, so the sum is one. Uh, so I have to move this because it's in my. Maybe yeah. also, yeah. maybe some people don't really uh, know the sign here. Um, yeah, this means proportional to. So this has the same relative differences as this. Oh, the same, the same shape. Yeah, same, same shape. So if I can, I will draw it again. So we have this one. This is a. <laughs> this is a distribution. Can I remove? Okay, this is a distribution, and so we are going to marginalize it, and it just becomes smaller. But the relative differences are the same. So this point divided by this point is the same as this point divided by this point. Is that clear? That means proportional. So we are the for the shape of this. It doesn't matter how uh, what the marginal likelihood is. Poop. Are there other questions? Okay. Um, if they ask for proof, of course, you see, you only need to do likelihood times prior without the integral. Um, well, the thing is, like, so, so proportionality proofs, uh, I, I think, don't always work. But, but I, it's, do we, for everything, for everything I've computed so far, they, 
they they are applicable. So if you if you if you just exclude all the terms that don't alter the shape of the distribution, I think this uh, this is a valid way of proving it. Yes. Yeah, and I remember from our exam, Florian, that uh, in question A you had to calculate the posterior form, and question B you had to calculate the marginal likelihood, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and the marginal likelihood you can still compute either way, because yeah. this will give you the posterior, and you know the you know the form of a general gamma, so you can directly directly deduct the form of the posterior, compare it to the prior times likelihood, and see. What you need to add to to that term in order to to make it equal to the posterior, and then you have your marginal likelihood. Yeah. So uh, is the marginal likelihood always the integral of the prior times the likelihood? Uh, yes, if it's uh, continuous, if it's discrete, you can take the sum instead of uh, integral. Uh, in the Bernoulli, but in the slides we didn't ignore the marginal likelihood, right? Uh, why couldn't we? nor there you can ignore it but it's better if you do calculate the marginal likelihood it's just unnecessary to find the form they will probably use it yeah but we are also going to show the uh, marginal likelihood yeah. guys and also the marginal likelihood doesn't cancel out here it, it's still here but it's just not important for the proof because the, the proof or what we want to prove is just that the the shape of the posterior is the same, or is the is the shape of a of a gamma distribution here, and the, as the Sieber explained perfectly, it, it, um, the marginal likelihood does nothing else than just sc scale it down. It, the shape will still be the same; it will just be described by different or with different uh, parameter values. That's all. Yeah, so we can find the conjugate form still if we. Uh only do the proportional uh, relation or proportional form. Uh, well, but uh, here, yeah. here's a question. So we are proving conjugacy instead of calculating the posterior. Um, no, you're like the, the, you see the last step, um, the last step where the, there is like this right arrow, this follows from this follows. Um, Maybe so, I should first explain yeah, maybe, maybe, the yeah. explanation and then yeah, we will come ahead. back to the questions. Yeah, so, yeah, we are going to only calculate the prior times the likelihood, which is this, and that we can uh, find out because we have lambda to the power of n, and here we have lambda to the power of alpha minus 1, and we can add those again from my proof. And then we have two exponentials as well, and we can add those two, and then we can, yeah, because we mo both terms have a minus lambda, we can remove, uh, put brackets around the rest. Um, and this is, if you look at uh, the prior, and again, this is the uh, marginalization of the prior. So if we only look at proportionality, we don't need it. So it's uh, the posterior we found is very similar to these two terms, right? So we have a new alpha, because our alpha is now alpha plus n, and we have a new beta, which is beta plus the sum over xi. And we can then with, write that as our posterior is a gamma using this alpha and this beta. Okay, there are again more questions in the chat. Uh, because uh, we have a prior on lambda, lambda. Oh, okay. Yes, I will answer that uh, after. We have a prior on lambda, so we are interested in what is the probability for every different lambda value. Uh, but if we leave this out and only look at this part, uh, the relative differences between lambdas, for example, zero dot one, uh, zero dot one, and zero dot two. The different, relative difference stays the same if we don't include this uh, factor or if we do include that factor. So that's why we can leave it out to uh, get to the form of the gamma. Okay. And then there was another. Okay. Uh, how do you go from A plus and 
minus 1 to 8 percent. Here it says uh, alpha minus 1 in the uh, prior. So if we here have alpha plus n minus 1, it's the same as filling in alpha plus or a plus n at the place of alpha. Uh, same. Yes, same concept as why we leave out the integral in the formula of the prior is also a minus one. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's the answer to another question. That's two. Should, shouldn't the lambda in the prior be? Uh, no. I don't see where that's coming from. Me neither. Because the lambda in the prior is just this formula. Okay, but on the next slide we will compute the marginal likelihood, so maybe that clears out the rest. So, uh, if we would use the found distribution over these two, alpha and beta, we can fill it in in the S and prior form, and we, uh, here, so where we first had beta alpha, we now have on the place of beta, beta plus the sum over x's, and on the place of the alpha, we have alpha plus n. And here, so in the gamma function, we had alpha in the prior, but now we have al alpha plus n. So now we have the posterior with the marginal, yeah, with the marginalization, so the marginal likelihood. And the complete marginal likelihood is this. So it's the prior likelihood times the, uh, or the marginal prior times the marginal uh, of the light or the sum of the likelihood, which is the marginal likelihood. Yeah. I mean, you can you can already see that. So what we previously did, right, was when we computed likelihood at times prior, we skipped over that marginalization term in the beginning and said it was it was proportional to what what comes after. So lambda to the power of a alpha plus n minus one times e to the power of blah blah blah, right? And in the posterior, we see that this term reappears. So, but the posterior is computed by likelihood, likelihood times prior divided by the marginal likelihood. So now we can think of like this whole term that's depicted in likelihood times prior divided by some term x such that it is equal to uh, the posterior that is given below. And uh, we can think of that x to, or we, we, have, we must include in that x the same marginalization constant simply to get rid of it in the likelihood times prior calculation. So we divide by it. That's why it's contained in the marginal likelihood. But then additionally, we need this a new marginalization constant to appear, uh, but in, in, the, in, in the flipped form. And since we're dividing by, uh, by, uh, by it, we have to use the inverse in order to end up with the flipped form in, um, for the posterior. Both. So we first calculate posterior and then uh, we could use the posterior to calculate the marginal likelihood that is used to compute this posterior. Yeah, that's actually what you can always do. So even if it asks you for the marginal, if, if the exercise would ask you for the marginal likelihood, you can simply uh, construct the posterior using proportionality. And then from the posterior, um, and the previous cal calculation of likelihood times prior, you can uh, you can deduce what the marginal likelihood would have to look like. Uh. Okay, so this is just the general form of the exact thing. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't we don't directly evaluate the integral, but we we deduce it what what it what it has to be here. Well, what seems pretty like weird to me is that you calculate the posterior without without the marginal likelihood, while the marginal likelihood is in the formula which we use to calculate okay. the posterior, and then all of a sudden you calculate the marginal 
like with, with a series. Or... I, I I would love to draw it once, like on a board or something. But c could you go uh, one once or uh, but let Seeger do? So this is how we uh, pay as rule uh, marginal likelihood. So posterior is the likelihood times the prior divided by the marginal likelihood. What we basically here did was marginal likelihood times pos po posterior is likelihood times pr uh, prior. So we calculate the likelihood times prior that was uh, that is the term we found on the uh, previous one so this if we then uh, use the found alpha and beta to find the normalization constant of the posterior that's this so we have the posterior now we only have to calculate the marginal likelihood which is uh, if we calculate this to this times this, then the resulting term is this one, which is the remaining part we found from calculating likelihood times prior. I, I think this one step where I'm missing what you're doing, you said like when we use alpha and beta to calculate that term you were just referring to, yeah. how do you get that term all of a sudden out of these alpha and beta? Because the uh, general form is, uh, let's go back. Uh, so here we have uh, a prior on a that I give an alpha and beta, and that's this form. So the alpha is plugged in here and here and here, and beta is plugged in here and here. So here we found a new alpha and a new beta, so we plug them in on those places. Okay. I think I get it. Thanks. We remove the number from power of eta. I'm not entirely sure what you mean, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Me neither. So by filling in our values in the gamma distribution, we found posterior alpha and beta, we get this, but we still have to calculate the marginal likelihood. Uh, and we do that by what remains here, and that is this part, times uh, this, because we didn't find this one yet in our previous form here. So that is how we find the marginal likelihood. But it's it's like the one of the most difficult parts of the course, probably. Yeah, but the thing is, once you understand how to apply proportionality and find the posterior without even having to compute the marginal likelihood, you can then afterwards deduce the marginal likelihood. The the posterior distribution. Um, how can I say this? Um, yeah, you, you, you just have to look at those terms which um, where the, the parameterization actually matters. So, for example, here the, the lambda to the power of alpha. Um, just from these terms alone, you can, so, so from the, without the marginal, marginalization constant, you can, uh, you can figure out what the posterior parameters will have to look like. And that's why you simply don't need the marginal likelihood. So... The other argument was it doesn't change the shape. This is another argument for it. So you, you can simply find, well, I mean, to, uh, to be honest, here we, we just know that the posterior will be a gamma, right? So we, if we, we abuse that fact. If nobody told us that it would be, um, would be conjugate, then yeah, we'd, we'd have a problem. But in this case, we, we abuse that fact by knowing that the posterior will be a gamma. So uh, on the next slide, we have an exercise for you on the same uh, topic, but with different distributions. Do you already? OK, there are more questions. Uh, we know that it should be a gamma because of the, yes. 
So if it's conjugate prior, will be the same as posterior. Yes, Elisardo. Sort of. We needed to get everything to one, but we could also compute the integral, but that's more difficult. Yeah, well, what we wanted to show you is that you, you, using this approach, you can answer both questions, what the posterior will look like and what the marginal likelihood will look like. So applying this procedure will answer both questions, which, which could be asked on the exam for different, for different conjugacy pairs. Okay, so are there any more questions? wait for a few seconds if someone is typing. Yes. Uh, so you want me to write out the numbers or like the oh, actual she, force? She asked whether the equation is correct, I think. Yes, that, that's possible to do. I'm not going to write all the terms, that's way too much work. Uh, so if we have this part, this is like the Bayes theorem, which is well known. If we do both parts times and L, this and L cancels. This ML cancels, so we have ML post, which is this part. Okay. Uh, yes, so let's do the exercise. So you have to uh, sh show the uh, form of the posterior and then should I also calculate the uh, marginal likelihood for this one? It'd yeah. be nice. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I, just, I just saw that it discussed the idea of a proportionality plot to prove it's supposed to mean. I don't know. <laughs> what? <laughs> what I thought there. Yeah, so this one you are first going to try yourselves and uh, if you need, if little uh, couple of people are stuck we can we uh, can show these steps but uh, basically the likelihood is binomial so do you still you still have to remember what a binomial is and the prior is a beta and they're conjugate i will give that away but you have to show what the posterior looks like and uh probably the marginal likelihood as well because i don't remember what i put in the next slide anymore so Let's go. What is the likelihood? What's the prior? Yeah, give the people some time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you don't have to answer it in the chat. Just do it for yourself. And uh, after a minute, I will uh, give away the answers, and then uh, you have a few more minutes to uh, calculate the posterior. The prior is the. Beta. So here, I'll be right back. Yes, you can. Uh, no, Chris Pay. Oh, sorry, that yes was meant to, to a need. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. You <laughs> yeah but they don't. But the point is uh, that you know how to uh, do it yourselves, and we didn't want to 
give you too complex ones. Just start with easy ones because then you understand it. But uh, for Chris Pine, the posterior is, if the pos prior is conjugate to the likelihood, the posterior will be the same form as the prior. Yes, of course, Chris Pine. <laughs> Vorsicht, Vorsicht. <laughs> uh, so, did everyone find the likelihood of the prior? Because these are known, so I can probably show them already. I will show them here. So, these are the likelihood and the prior that we are going to use. Yeah, alternatively, you could have also used uh, K instead of X, which adheres to the, I think, the, the formal, the formal distribution, but yeah, it doesn't matter. You think X is cool? Yeah, I thought X they, was cool. Then you're a real mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> So, should I just show the first step, Florian? I don't know. What what do people think? I don't think the first step is really useful. <laughs> no, it's, it's just supposed to show that we ignore it, the bottom part, or we can safely ignore it. Oh, that's too much. So, uh... Does everybody know what to do? Or are there questions? Okay, you're confused. Uh, what are you confused about? <laughs> oh. Yeah, with the proportionality aspect, you can skip calculating the uh, the uh, integral, the mar marginal likelihood. Yeah, what, what, what you made use of was the fact that the, the beta function is actually the integral of likelihood times prior. But for some other, like for some other conjugacy pairs, that's just not as easy to see. Oh, you can just see through it. Yeah, it, it, indeed, it helps helps to cancel out that that term that's carried uh, on the top of the fraction. But technically, you don't even need that term because that also doesn't influence the shape. To calculate the form of the posterior, you only need the terms in which uh, theta and x are directly used. So uh, this one. Oh. This one, this one, this one, and this one. Although I think here we skipped over the binomial coefficient as well. Yeah, true, but I said there should be an x in it. Yeah. The marginal it's likelihood never influences the shape. It influences like the the relative the uh, yeah the the numbers on the y axis are influenced by the marginal likelihood.
maybe there is some weird example we're not thinking of where it, but no just like conceptually it, it never influences it so here this is our posterior and this is it's the height is, is for example two and the sum of the whole posterior is five that's not good so we divide it by five no we divide this by five and the every every point we divide by five and then the shape stays the same, only the values on the y-axis change. Yeah, the size indeed, Elisardo. Oh yeah, Florian also is yes. So for example, if we look at the numbers four and eight, then the sum is 12. 8 is 2 times as big as 4, but if we divide both by 12, we get 1 third and 2 third, and 2 third is again 2 times as big as 1 third. So the relative difference stays the same. Okay. I don't yep. know if that helped or made things more. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can show the next step. Yeah, okay, so the next step is this. Sorry for the, uh, the, the P over there. But we can again take the proportional step and then say that's proportional again to uh, doing this theta times this theta uh, times this theta, or yeah, this theta times this theta. We can add the uh, powers, but we don't need these terms because they're just normalization constants. Okay. And then we can rewrite this part. Oh, there just appeared a few questions. How do you know? Yeah, we should have. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just reading the question. You should have. We should have. I was saying we should have included um, with the binomial coefficient there. Yeah, that, that makes things as clear, but uh, clear, but uh, so it should be uh, this in front of it. Uh, but again, we can see if we look at this part and compare it to the posterior we found, we can see that alpha minus 1 is replaced by x plus alpha minus 1. So the new alpha is x plus alpha and the same holds for the beta. So now we have n minus x plus beta. Okay, yeah, we don't compute the marginal likelihood for this one. <laughs> no, but, but you can do it maybe yourself. Are you talking to me or to the to the students? Yeah, to the students. Yeah, okay. I don't see where the combination goes. The the combination is cancelled out by by the bottom term because the marginalization in in in, in uh, for the binomial uh, for the binomial beta so for the binomial likelihood times the beta prior, the marginalization is simply the integral where the binomial coefficient is pulled in front of, right? That's what you can do with integrals. Yes, yeah, so what Florian means is we have the integral from, uh, from one, oh my god, one to zero over uh, theta. And it is uh, the prior, so pr times uh, n over x times. Uh, that stuff. So I will call that Bernoulli, but that, because it's oh no, it's not a Bernoulli. No, I will call it uh, stuff. But since uh, this part doesn't depend on theta, it's the same as saying n over x times the integral with stuff in it, and then we have uh, above and below in the fraction we have uh, an n over x, and they defy cancel out.
Yeah, well, the, the N N NCX is not removed. Um, so the binaural coefficient is not removed due to the proportionality. It's removed because you can rewrite the, the marginal likelihood by pulling out the binomial coefficient in front of it. Yeah, we will do that afterwards. And uh, again, we'll first answer the other questions. Uh, yes, because they will be the same for the likelihood times prior divided by uh, the same for the likelihood times prior as for the marginal likelihood. But yeah, te I mean, technically, you know. We don't ignore it just to ignore it. We ignore it because we can cancel it in the fraction. They can be left out to compute the posterior values of alpha. The, the one divided by uh, the beta function with input parameters alpha beta is uh, simply constant. It's all it's a normalization. That's the that's the marginalization or the normalization of the beta function. So it it also doesn't give the beta uh, so the beta distribution. It also doesn't add anything to the shape of the beta distribution. So we can also drop it here. And then later get it back. Later get it back, yeah. But it's uh, not necessary necessary in order to find the the, the 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 new parameters for the posterior. Because those are just the ones that appear in the term terms that that carry the parameter we are trying to find the posterior for. So the theta. I hope I'm not being too technical here. Um, all, all distribution have a marginalization term and the binomial doesn't. But you can, t so what you can do is you can take any function you want, right? Specify, specify a domain for that function and marginalize it, and there you have your distribution. You can do that for a function like, like f of x, for example. So again, we can uh, see this as the ml times the posterior is prior times likelihood. And uh, this term is the prior uh, times likelihood, but then we, uh, or let's say, this term is the complete prior times likelihood. Uh, uh, however, we know the posterior is going to be of this form, so we uh, will divide this side by one over this. Uh, but we know the in the ML there is also a single n over x term, so they will cancel from both sides. So our eventual, uh, so the, and we know the posterior, so what we basically are left with is uh, uh, how can I explain this? Uh, Beta B times the ML times the posterior. Okay, uh, where's my eraser? I'm now going to erase this part again. So So the beta function times the marginal likelihood times the posterior 
is equal to this. And then to, just to be complete, we have an N O. We divide over N over X. So now we want to find a marginal likelihood, uh, which will be this, uh, which will cancel out this term, this term, and the uh, additional for term the posterior will get when we fill it in as the in the like this way to get to this distribution. Right, Florian. Sorry, I was answering. Uh, um, oh, okay, no, then, no, uh, I will just continue because I think I'm right. Uh, so if we fill in the posterior pos of uh, the new stuff we found, so with the new alpha, which is, uh, where is it, x plus a and the new beta, we will get this divided by beta with x <laughs> plus alpha. Maybe you should clear the slide, Elizardo says. Yes, but then all my precious work will go <laughs> away. So we fill these in as in this way. Uh, so that's the term we are here going to get if we only we want to find the marginal likelihood that will make the posterior equal to this term. So the eventual marginal likelihood is uh, uh, I'm confusing myself right now. Yeah, the mar marginal likelihood is I will for uh, to make things uh, clear. I will start here. That's a joke. That's n over x times the beta x plus alpha. <laughs> oh my god. That's, this is an x minus, minus x here. Yes, eraser. N minus x plus beta divided by beta a b. So this is the marginal likelihood of this function. Right, Florian? Mm -hmm. Yes. And how did I find this? Well, if I do n over x divided by n over x, and I do uh, 1 over, oh, I don't have to point with my finger. I, I have so, to. Yeah. So n over x divided by n over x cancel each other, b, b a b over b a b cancel each other. And if we fill in the new uh, uh, new alpha and beta into the posterior, we'll get this term. So this cancels with this because I, you can't read it, but it's the same. So we are left with this proportional term of the posterior. So that is how you calculate the marginal likelihood. It's very unclear. I'm sorry we both don't have the drawing pad. And it's also pretty difficult to do this in text. <laughs> Does it, it's like, is there still confusion left about how to obtain the marginal likelihood from the posterior? Can you do it again on a new slide? Yes, let's go. All right, but I'll head to the bathroom real quick. Yes. Boom. Are you now happy? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do anything anymore. No, uh, okay. Uh, so, we found a new alpha and a new beta, right? With By doing the... Uh, by doing calculating the pos posterior with propor proportionality. This is, this is new alpha, this is new beta, right? If we fill this in as if it would be the prior, how the prior distribution works. So here it's, it just should say, like it's clear, it should say theta given alpha and beta. Now we have theta given new alpha, new beta. If we fill that in, 
we get this part. So I will put that here so as well. So, uh, but I won't write it down because you won't be able to read it anyways. Divided by beta x plus alpha comma n minus x plus beta. Uh, yes, n times the n over x. That I am sorry. Oh yeah, that's you. This is the complete posterior distribution. You, oh, uh, x, yeah, n over x, complete posterior distribution if we use this new theta and new beta. But now we want to find the marginal likelihood such that this part is uh, this part times the terms we ignored before because we the type. You can see it as ignoring. You can also see it as where we here have the posterior and here we have the likelihood times the prior. We are just, instead of ignoring, we are going to multiply or divide it by so that all terms will go to that side and we only keep the relevant stuff here. And then later on, when we know the posterior, we can calculate those terms back. So, in, uh, instead of having the n over x in this term, we say, okay, we do 1 over n over x. And instead of saying, oh, we divide by beta here, we are going to say we're going to multiply it with the, this term. Instead of having that on this side, we, have, we are going to multiply both sides, which will result in this. And we have the marginal likelihood over here. So we have these four terms and we want to make it so that the marginal likelihood will uh, make sure that this times this times this, because this is the posterior, is this. Is that clear? How do you know you should add the n over x that isn't given? Uh, because it's in the likelihood. Yeah. Oh yeah, you also answer Excellent. questions. Uh, and what what is the final? Can we use proportionality? Yes, I know, but sure. What? I know, but Seeger suddenly adds it when... What do you mean, Alistair? Do you want to fight? <laughs> Always. Um, but what I meant is if you fill in the beta distribution, you should get the all of the things that you described up above, but then divided by B, uh, x plus a, comma, n minus x plus b, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. not the, times the n yes, over x. Yes, you are right. Even I can make a mistake. Yeah, thanks, Elisardo. Yeah, so I'm sorry. So this is what we currently have. So we have a beta term times o, n over x division times this posterior we found. And this L times P is this term. So now we want to find the margin, marginal likelihood such that this times this times this equals this. Right, guys? So... Yes, yes, so that is, if we want to cancel out, because we don't have a beta term in this one, we have to cancel it out. So that means ML, ML starts with one over beta function. Okay, and since our L times P doesn't include a one over uh, n, one divided by n over x, we have to include a one, one over x to cancel it out as well. And since our posterior distribution includes this term, uh, 
and it isn't included in uh, the L times P, we also have to multiply the marginal likelihood with beta X O plus alpha times N. Oh, that's an N. Oh, okay, that worked out. So this is our marginal likelihood because we cancel each term that we don't want to have on the other side. Oh, your mouse is, okay, I didn't know that. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so I don't know what, when you mean yes. The two most left terms on the, yeah, okay. So our L times P is this term times this term. Uh, but since we only want to look at the terms relevant where the theta is relevant, yeah, that's it. We don't care about x. We only care about theta. So that is why we want to do something with this term and this term. So we just put it on the other side and we'll uh -huh. deal with it later. So we can find this term without ugly beta functions and combinatorial uh, stuff. Uh, so we put it here, but for this one, we have to multiply the both sides to get rid of it. And for this one, we have to divide by bo both sides to get rid of it. Yeah, I, uh, my second explanation was better than my first. So I hope <laughs> it's clear now. Uh, this was, yeah, so. Where is my final slide? Yes, <laughs> here is the final slide. So uh, please laugh at our, uh, Florian's joke. I, uh... No, I just yeah, took I it from, uh, <laughs> from Max Meme Collection. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Bayesian is better, better than frequentist. So if, if you're still, okay, there are already questions. Yes, made it clear. I if I understand correctly, you can just multiply your prior likelihood, only get the interesting values, fill in those values in your question. Yes. Yeah, okay, tips on the creating generative and graphical models. Uh, do you want to take care of that, Florian? Then I'm going to get some water. Yeah, it's it's, it's a little bit difficult to uh, to show that here. Um, <sighs> the way I usually approach it is so you usually depending on what kind of model you have, you, you have like that that one dependent, uh, that one independent variable, and you you start out with that, right? And then you just follow along the dependencies of your of your generative model. I usually do it the other way around. So I first start with a generative model, uh, and then I convert that into the graphical model because the generative model gives you gives you immediately the dependencies, and from the dependencies you can draw the arrows in the graphical model. This is about the, how do you do it your do you first yeah. start with the graphical or first with the generative model mm. yeah first with the generative model uh, yeah. yeah i think also in the in the in the guide it's the other way around which i find a bit surprising you can use the graphical model first to put all the variables in if you don't know what distributions you're going to use yet yeah, but this seems like very odd thought, right? You know, they should, or? The best way is to start with the observed variable because yeah. that will be uh, like uh, on the bottom and you e can easily know if that's a Bernoulli binomial and then you can see, okay, it's a Bernoulli, so I need a theta. And then you have a theta and then you can see, okay, what is, will from the text uh, of the exercise, what will be the prior of the theta? Mm -hmm. um, 
common common uh, models are alongside the GMM is also the binomial rate difference model. So where you you observe that certain amount of people from a group, um, yeah, uh, do a certain thing with a certain probability, and you want to compare the probability of doing that thing between those groups. That's the binomial rate difference model. Yeah, so the one for the uh, climate uh, predictors yeah, exactly. of uh, yeah. Europe and uh, Westeros. Yes. I feel like the most important takeaway from, from this crash course is actually like that you, you're able to do like the proportionality proof on, and from there get the marginal likelihood. Maybe can can you maybe all give feedback once, like really honest, whether you feel like you can do that on your own now. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's. Yes. What should we do, uh, Florian? Uh, should we maybe do one like fr from scratch, uh, Gamma the Poisson, or the Gaussian? Gamma Poisson is also. We wanted to include that, anyways, right? And yeah, true. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, nice, Chris Pan. Oh, sorry, there was a question. I'm going to go, but I really want to thank you guys for this fresh course. It really helped me. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> yes, but how do you want... Because we have no other way, better way of drawing. Uh, uh, I mean, I take. I have a whiteboard right next to my desk. <laughs> yeah, okay, you can use that. Wait, if they can, can, but I need to clean it up first. Uh oh, did you draw <laughs> boobies? All right. Uh, Let's see how I'm going to do this. Um, Yes. Um, no. Okay. How how to do this? Um, maybe you you guys do it once, and um, I'll I'll do it alongside on the whiteboard, and uh, in like five minutes we can compare, and then I'll go stepwise over my solution. Maybe that's the probably the best way to do it. So, attempt it yourself. Uh, we said prior is going to be a gamma again, and the likelihood is going to be um, a a poisson. Exactly. Um, maybe this time, or, or for the sake of simplicity, should we use uh, independent, multiple independent samples again? I don't think that that's a lot right. I mean, let's let's do that oh, actually. Please do. Yes. Okay. 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 So uh, we assume that the likelihood is is just as the likelihood for the exponential just now that. It's uh, uh, distributed according to a Poisson. All right. Let me... <laughs> Let me quickly get Poisson.
and the correct slide and from the gamma Thank <laughs> you. 